Okay, and so these are kind of like the instructions of the night. So if you could please um, mute yourself just because it helps everyone uh, have a better experience in listening to both um, Yanshi and Hiromi, that would be really great. So we're going to work from the chat function. So as Yanshi and Hiromi speak to one another and if a question pops up, please pop it into the chat. Um, I will say though that we won't be answering questions until the very end. So it's not gonna be kind of like a back and forth um, if you've been to one of our tours. It's just gonna be towards the end and I will keep track of all of those questions. I think this might be a, a fun format because when I go to lectures, I have a question and I forget by the end, but now we have this awesome chat function so you can just pop it in and I'll take note of it. Um, so now I'm going to introduce Dr. Yenshi Lerman Tan, who is the inaugural Coates Foundation Trinity University SAMA postdoctoral post fellow. It's a mouthy one. <laughs> She received her PhD in art history from Stanford University in 2019 and her bachelor's in American studies from Yale University in 2011. She specializes in American art and culture from 19th century to present. Her research and teaching interests include forgotten and understudied American artists, Asian American art, and the movement of works of art across space and time. Her research has been supported by the Smithsonian American Art Museum and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Um, hey, Yinchi. <laughs> hey, everyone. Thank you so much, Johanna, for the very nice um, introduction. <laughs> and I'll just echo you in welcoming everyone uh, to this um, artist conversation. And uh, it's nice to know that during this time, even though um, the museum is still currently closed, that we can still talk about and experience um, works of art um, through media like Zoom and through these amazing artist conversations um, like our conversation tonight with Hiromi Stringer. Um, and I just would like to note that artist conversations uh, like this one um, tonight was made possible thanks to the Lewis A. and Francis B. Wagner um, Fund. So it is my pleasure to introduce our um, guest of honor this evening, Hiromi Stringer. Hiromi Stringer was born in Kyoto, Japan. Currently, she is a drawing lecturer at the University of Texas at San Antonio, um, UTSA. Uh, and she did tell me that she moved her drawing class online um, in this time, which is Sounds very difficult, um, so amazing she was able to do that. She was selected for the 2021 Summer Arts Faculty Residency Program at Oxbow School of Art and Artist Residency. She was awarded the 2019-2020 De Dallas Foundation Master of Fine Arts Fellowship upon graduating from UTSA with an MFA in art, where she studied, multiple, um, studied with multiple merit-based scholarships. She was selected for an artist residency program um, in the uh, Blue Star Contemporary Berlin Residency um, in Berlin, Germany, and she re received the grand prize for Eyes Got It 2014. Um, her recent solo exhibition at the Southwest School of Art, which I'll be showing you some installation shots of, um, called the Umayama Time Teleportation Museum, will be a traveling exhibition, including the Nave Museum in Victoria, Texas in 2021. Um, and the, uh, she's a resident of the San Antonio area. She's exhibited widely, um, including at uh, um, Art Pace, Blue Star, the McNay, the Southwest School, UTSA Gallery, Cinnabar, and many, um, many other venues. So welcome, um, Hiromi. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. And we're so excited to be here. Hello, thank you. And then <laughs> welcome to my messy studio. <laughs> where the magic happens. Um, so just to kick us off here, uh, I mentioned your solo exhibition at the Southwest School of Art um, in San Antonio, here in San Antonio, and I wanted to start um, by showing everyone just a couple installation shots um, of this work called the Umayama Time Teleportation Museum, and here you see it installed in 2018. Um, and I'll just provide a little bit of background first um, before we ask Hiromi about this work um, for everyone in the audience. And essentially what you're seeing here is an immersive work that is um, a fictional or um, kind of imagined museum that focuses on the life of 19th century Japanese scholar Shoei Umayama. 
um, who was suddenly and inexplicably transported to 21st century South Texas. Uh, and so he observed um, what he saw in San Antonio and South Texas, and he took notes and drawings, and then he is inexplicably transported back to 1840s Japan. Um, and this happens to him a number of times, um, and so the museum and the installation is comprised of Umayama's reports, observations, notes, um, diagrams, and drawings. So here's um, a couple other installation shots, and I just wanted to ask, you, Hiromi, maybe you could tell us a little bit more about what kinds of things um, we're seeing here in these installation shots um, and what kind of things a visitor who walked through this Umeyama Time Teleportation Museum would find. Yeah, um, Umeyama Time Teleportation Museum is, yes, dedicated to create for the historical time teleport time traveler Shoei Umeyama. And then while he stayed in South Texas, he created vast amount of journals. So here um, in this uh, presentation slide, we are seeing his journals of um, the plants he found in South Texas. So these are the uh, cactus. So in South Texas, we can see so many cactus here and there, and they are wild cactus. We do not, we do not need to really buy cactus, but in Japan, especially at around 19th century, cactus was really uh, expensive ones. So people traded cactus for really uh, a lot of money, just like the uh, tulips in Holland. So uh, it was very surprising for him to find cactus here and there. And then it's, you know, it's really like for free. So he thought, wow, I'm gonna, I can be really rich collecting cactus. But um, he was just, just staying here. So instead of collecting all the cactus, he created all the journals of all the different kinds of cactus he found here. Interesting. So I'm, you're making me see that in this particular install shot in the case, we can see, um, his drawings of cacti. Um, and in this previous shot, you see also these sort of specimen cases. Um, yeah. Are there also cactus related things in those cases or are, are there other things? Yeah, I remember he collected maybe few, few needles from cactus leaves, but other than that, he collected a lot of found items here from from the street, especially well at the school parking lot. He <laughs> found so many different kinds of items at the uh, school parking lot, from the uh, little water bottles to the paints or stationaries, some candies. So those items are kept in those boxes. So each of the items should have so many different stories behind. Great. Um, it's so interesting and I think we just get a little bit of the feeling here of being in this immersive kind of space that is, um, as, as you've said, the specimens and found objects collected by this fictional time traveler that you um, created, Shoei Umiyama. Um, so let me just flip here to uh, a still image, um, one of the artworks that um, would have been installed here on the wall in 2018 at the Southwest School. Um, and this is one example, I guess, of, of one of Umiyama's interpretations of kind of South Texas culture. So for those of us who are here in San Antonio, you'll recognize um, the Whataburger sign, um, various traffic cones. Um, so Hiromi, maybe you can tell us a little bit more of what's in here, but I guess my understanding of this work that is called the Sacred Red and White is that um, Umayama believes that there's some significance to this coloring of red and white that he sees in this landscape. Um, and that he develops this theory that um, the red and white has some kind of sacred or religious meaning to bring safety and peacefulness um, to 
to the people, to construction workers. So maybe you could tell us a little bit more about what we're seeing here and also the medium in which this work is made, Sumi Inc., and whether that would have been, why you imagined that as Umayama's medium. Okay, so in my fantasy, this work is not my work. This work is Umeyama's work, my fictional character's work. So uh, he was, uh, maybe I should say he is, but he is a 19th century man. And he did not have any ballpoint pen or Sharpie or anything. <laughs> and he did not, right? And he did not have any uh, nice sketchbooks. So his main medium to record everything was really the ink and brush. And then some Japanese paper, we call it washi or oriental paper or Japanese paper. So Umeyama was a 19th century scholar. So it was his nature to record everything he sees. And then he tried to analyze them and he tried to understand what they are doing there. So as Inshi mentioned, he found some kind of significance in the uh, found orange and white or um, magenta and white color combinations. In Japan, the color combination of red and white is auspicious color combination. So at the, uh, so like in Umeyama's drawing on the left down left below, left lower side, you can see a Shinto priest kind of praying at the uh, constructional site. So in that kind of auspicious, auspicious occasions, Japanese people utilize red and white color to create more auspiciousness. So um, coincidentally, Umeyama found so many red and white color combination in South Texas and then he tried to analyze why they are utilizing this color. And then one of the conclusions he received was at the construction sites, color cones. Umeyama thought that those colors are, of course, they really attract our eyes. But in addition to that, maybe these colors are added there to protect the workers who works over there because right next to the color cones, so many traffic's going on. So in that kind of very dangerous situation, Umeyama thought the color combination red and white will add extra layer of protection. Um, thank you so much. It's really interesting to hear you talk about both the layers of fiction that you have in this, in this um, amazing set of works and also the origin of um, Umiyama's belief that this this red and white color combination that he's seeing everywhere would have had some kind of special significance. Um, and I guess I'm trying not to disrupt the fantasy that he is a real historical figure, but yes, for the clarity of the audience, this figure is an invention of, um, of Hiromi's uh, as part of this um, a, a, as part of this artwork. So I guess one of the things I wanted to ask you is um, how did you develop this character um, and what sort of inspired you to create him and to kind of flesh out all of this um, information about his fictional biography? Mm -hmm. Okay, I would like to show you like this little book here. So this is a uh, Japanese English textbook, maybe about 100 years old, maybe. So I purchased this book in Kyoto several years ago at the antique book sh bookshop. So um, I didn't think that much at that time, but after I brought back this book here in Texas, I found the previous owner's name here. Can you see here? Um, we, can, we can sort of see it. Um, okay. You move it a little closer to the camera. Okay, here. Okay, yeah, now we can see it. And it looks like it says Aisho Omayama. Right, exactly. And then inside he writes his name several times. 
Eisho Umeyama. It seems like he was really excited about writing his name in alphabet. Hmm. Right. Uh, so this is for the beginner's English textbook. So maybe he just learned how to write alphabets. So um, I can see his excitement. But in addition, as soon as I brought back this book to my studi studio in Texas, I started to imagine about, well, maybe this real person, Umeyama, never imagined that his textbook came across the ocean mm. and then arriving in Texas studio. Mm -hmm. so he was studying English and it seems like he was not a good learner. I don't see any that much writing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but I think he never imagined that his textbook would be coming to the US. So um, I felt something from having this copy here. Yeah. Then, yeah. Well, That's amazing um, to see the actual object. And I think so many of us have had that, especially, especially the kind of, you know, book files among us have that experience of going to a used bookstore and finding a book and you find someone's name in the cover. Um, so I love that you showed that to us. That is so interesting and also hilarious that, you know, you think he wasn't such a good student, but he was kind of excited about writing his name and the way in which the book traversed all of this space. Um, and landed here in Texas too. And I guess that just, um, that also has me thinking about, you know, all of us interact with these things from the past, whether it's like an old book, um, like your book or a work of art. And, um, you know, your work is, this work is so much about time travel. Um, and so I guess I'm just gonna flip through and show just another example here so we can rest our eyes on some other amazing work by you slash um, Umayama and here I guess is a report about um, fire hydrants which he yeah. coins this term mokenshu uh, mm -hmm. and um, believes that that they also have some kind of totemic power so um, you can tell us more about that and then I'm also interested um, and what about what we're looking at here and then I'm also interested just more in this question of time travel and you've said a little bit about how you you know your imagination was spurred to create this character but why I guess were you thinking of him specifically as a time traveler? Yeah maybe um, so I think around 2015 or 14 the first time I started to create this body of work I was really bored or maybe I was really lonely living in kind of suburb and subdivision neighborhood. So, um, so living in the suburb or subdivision is really convenient and comfortable, but at the same time, it's, I'm sorry, it's kind of boring. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I feel you. I've lived in the, you know, in the boring suburbs of California too. and. Yeah. Can, so Not a, a lot happens. <laughs> yeah. So it's a kind of luxury having those very nice, convenient life, but um, everything is so clean and everything is so uniform. So uh, I was a little bit bored. And after getting this book, I started to really think about, okay, so this is a very ordinary quotidian object or the cityscape, but what if Umeyama sees this creation? What would he think about these things? Or now we know how a car works, or now we know how to drive cars, or now- I, I don't know how it works. <laughs> <laughs> Me neither, but anyway, we are kind of driving, or anyway, we are kind of using these creations but, and then we believe somebody knows how it works. And yes, somebody knows how it works. And we are kind of receiving that kind of benefit. But if Umeyama 
Ruby sees these kind of things, how does he really conclude? How would he really explain these amazing things? So once I started to think like that, the ordinary boring scenery became, you know, as a much story. more exciting. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, one of the things about your work that's really interesting um, to learn about in right now in our moment is that I think some of us are kind of having that experience at home right now where we're, you know, we're not traveling necessarily to places we usually you know, took trips to, um, we're sort of in our neighborhoods. And um, I heard on a podcast, uh, someone was saying, you know, in right now, people are kind of realizing like certain wildlife lives in their neighborhood that they never realized was there before. And so this work about Umayama, I think has a kind of a relevance to our moment right now in terms of what you're saying, where we're sort of looking at the different things in our own neighborhoods and being like, oh, yeah, what is what is the significance of that? Or I never noticed that there was like a post or a house there before. Um, so, so I love that this work is about kind of defamiliarizing mm -hmm. the landscape that is all around us. Um, the work is also so funny uh, when you said like, you know, Umayama wouldn't have had a Sharpie or <laughs> he didn't have <laughs> like, you know, these a ballpoint pen, like there is, something really hilarious about the fact that he misinterprets things that are so mundane as being kind of um, sacred or important in certain ways. Um, so here is a set of uh, paper amulets of the Mokenshu, which you could, maybe you could tell us a little bit about these amulets, but my understanding is that um, he develops this notion that these are totemic objects, the fire hydrant and then creates these amulets for protection to disseminate in Japan upon his return? Yes. So uh, basically he created new cult slash business. <laughs> 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 so after he returned to Japan, he talked about his experience to his friend. His friend was a Shinto priest. So they discussed about the possibility of having Mokenshu, fire hydrant, as one of their Shinto goddess. And then their conclusion was kind of creating this kind of paper amulets and then sell them to people. And then this kind of paper amulets or talisman are pretty popular in Japan. And the people place these things at their doorstep to ward off evil spirits, or sometimes maybe as a protection from disease. So the three paper amulets you are seeing here on the screen are the examples. Yeah. Yeah, that's so great. Now I really want one to put on my doorstep. <laughs> um, and it's interesting too, because a, a lot of different cultures, I think, even though you're talking specifically about Japanese culture, um, I think a lot of cultures have these kind of, you know, amulet type protection things for the doorstep. Um, so I guess just getting back to this idea of like humor and miscommunication, um, I'm wondering too about how these works and the misinterpretation of Umayama, um, of the red and white, of the fire hydrant and its and its meaning. Um, I guess why why was why did humor or why did this feel like it was funny to you? And what about kind of miscommunication or cross cultural communication? Is funny and should we think of it as more funny than are we too serious about it? Um, and yeah, <laughs> that's a lot, but. <laughs> yeah. um, let's see, um, maybe uh, this is one of the very important as aspect of artwork, but seeing things from different perspective is really a strong tool to, for survival, I think. I am mm -hmm. sure Umeyama had a really hard time living in South Texas because he didn't have any friends and he didn't know how to speak English. Maybe maybe he knows hello or something like that. But 
he had so many hardships, but um, just to get going, he needed to employ some different perspective to, to uh, how, well, to deal with the reality, I think. Yeah, I think um, the other thing that what you're saying and what the works make me think about is that, you know, artists, um, immigrant artists um, often kind of have this special ability to see American culture in a particular way and kind of reveal it in a way that perhaps an artist who is, you know, born and raised in South Texas wouldn't necessarily be able to defamiliarize it in the way that you have been able to through this work. So um, I think that's something, yeah, really special about artists who, who are immigrants um, or have moved from other places. Um, so I want to just hone in now also on another aspect of the inst installation and just show um, everyone, these are drawings of the labels of um, each of these uh, Sumi Inc. drawings that I've shown you was accompanied by a drawing of labels, which you see on the left. And then um, on the right is a detail. Uh, and I've just pulled that out and enlarged it so you can read the text. So this would have accompanied um, this in the installation of the Teleportation Museum. Um, and it's interesting, I think, for all of us as museum goers or people who you know spend a lot of time at SAMA, um, to think about, to see your work and think about like the museum as a space and that's something you clearly are interested in. Um, so I wanted to ask you if you, if you grew up going to any particular museums um, and if you were thinking about any museum in particular when you were making this work that kind of emulates a museum. Yes, for the uh, kind of, I have a model institute, I have two model institute for UTTM. UTTM refers to Umeyama Time Teleportation Museum, by the way. So right. one is um, an insti institutional museum in Japan at Tokyo University. Tokyo University has a nice little natural history museum. So um, that museum has a very nice quality of very authentic feeling, plus some kind of handmade aspect. And then the other institute I really utilized for this body of work is actually SAMA. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know yeah. yeah, I went to SAMA so many times to take photos for the uh, fire alarms or high growth thermometers or maybe the uh, thermostats or those little things. Yeah. Right. Well, that is so funny. Um, that <laughs> makes a lot of sense. I think, you know, for those of us, for me or for Johanna, you know, we spend time writing museum labels. And so your work, I think, speaks to people who attend museums a lot or, um, or work in museums in a kind of particular way. Um, I wanted to just kind of follow on that and, and ask you, you know, what what kind of terminology you use for this UTTM, whether you think of it as like an imagined museum or, um, you know, is it a fake museum? I, I think imagining it at the Southwest School, would you, when viewers entered, is there some period of time where they don't really know that it's um, an artwork? And yeah, do you, how does that factor into the museum -iness of it? <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, I, so at the Southwest School of Art, at the openings, I became a, a museum docent. And then I gave a museum tour at the gallery. And um, so um, I feel some of the viewers are really confused about the, uh, if it's really a fictional museum or is that is this museum really exists somewhere. So at least three people came to me and then where do you really locate or yeah, they asked me that kind of questions. 
so um, it was a special <laughs> experience. That's so funny. I think um, that's part of what's humorous about the work, but also kind of amazing is that it's blending this fictional world and that it creates this imagined universe so fully that you could really, I mean, it's so fully fleshed out that you could really believe like this was a real person. He was a time traveler. He traveled from Japan to South Texas, like this happened. <laughs> I am definitely um, living the fantasy. And I think that it's really interesting too that you uh, mentioned that the Natural History Museum was, um, in addition to SAMA, something that you were thinking about in making this work, especially, we'll just scroll back here to the, these installation shots, but there is this kind of feeling of the specimen or the scientific um, in, in this work and also others of your works, um, which we'll get to. So um, yeah, maybe, um, maybe you could tell us a little bit about, though, your interest in science um, or the anthropological or natural history and this idea of kind of displaying science. Um, I think you have a background in science, is that right? That's right. Um, I have a bachelor in science. I studied um, biochemistry once, so maybe that is kind of really influenced me, influencing me to creating this kind of scientific display method, but um, I guess one of the questions I have been asking myself is, is the work really needs to be my work? Mm. So I think that question is really from my science background, because mm. in the science field, really the subject I is really not the actual really important thing. So in the science field, I believe the, um, the most important thing is the, uh, how the things work or the, um, the, uh, the universal truth or some, some kind of you can measure or feel. But in the art world, one thing very different from science field is somehow I felt the artworks have some kind of subject, like I'm not talking about the subject in the still life drawing or anything, but sometimes artworks are, people say, it's the expression of artist. In that case, I somehow feel that artwork is the voice of the artist. So which means the true subject of the artwork is I equal the artist. So in the Umeyama Time Teleportation Museum work, I tried to really erase that subject I by choosing Umeyama as the creator of that ink drawing. And for the graphite drawing, there's not that many um, uh, visible, like the strokes. Right, the artist's so, hand. Yeah. So there's no, not that many artist's hand. So I try to really um, erase my traces from the artworks. Um, that is so, so interesting to hear you talk about. And now looking at this, it does kind of have the feeling that you've almost like dusted or covered your tracks a little bit um, as the artist. And I apologize to everyone for, you know, flipping back and forth so quickly, but I just want to scroll back to this original installation shot um, and just relating to what you're saying about kind of erasing the artist and having the presence of this other um, character kind of be the central thing. I just wanted to point out that um, the drawing on the back wall that you can see here, you've created this shadow, I guess, presumably of Umeyama um, mm -hmm. himself. And so there is this kind of feeling of his presence throughout all of this, all of this work and especially in that one. Um, but like you're saying, not a presence necessarily, a clear kind of physical presence or trace of you, um, you personally as the artist. So I, I think that's so interesting. And I think many other great artists um, like you are interested in that question of kind of 
where does the artist stand and can the artist sort of be erased or collapsed? Um, that's something I've been interested in studying and you know other American artists work so thank you for sharing that with us um, I just want to I realize that the time is flying by and it's so fascinating to talk you, to you about the time teleportation museum but I do want to um, highlight another uh, series of years um, I will just note another hilarious thing I think about this piece is there is a Facebook page um, under business info it says that it was started in 1847 <laughs> uh, so anyone can visit the digital presence of the UTTM if you want to experience more um, Umeyama on Facebook and also at your website haramistringer.com um, so I wanted to also highlight this series of works of yours, which I love so much, called the book page drawings. Um, and here we're seeing one called Picnic Table Manners. Um, and this, it's, you know, there are certain themes that are similar to the UTTM in terms of kind of translation or miscommunication and also humor. Um, and my understanding from this work is that you took pages from um, Miss Manners Etiquette Guide. Yes, um, definitely and tore them out. So this is, it's a little bit hard to see in reproduction, but this is the actual page. Is that correct? Yes. And then the drawing is over it. Um, so I'd love to hear a little bit, and everyone would love to hear about your, how you came across uh, the Miss Manners etiquette book and what is your relationship to it? Okay. So I came to the U.S. 2008, and then I started to create this body of work, maybe three, four years after that. So I was still kind of adjusting myself living in the U.S. So when I came to the U.S., I was 31 or two years old. So, um, and then until then, I grew up in Japan and I went to college. I worked for companies. So um, living in the U.S. was totally different. So um, I wanted to be really uh, assimilate to this environment as soon as possible so that I will not stand out as a kind of foreigner. So uh, one of the tools I chose was this Miss Manners etiquette book. And then I read this Japanese translation in Japan when I was in high school and then I thought if I really understand this etiquette manner, maybe I can survive in the U.S. really perfectly. <laughs> maybe that was the kind of beginning point. And, yeah. Well, one of the benefits of talking to you um, while you're in your own studio um, rather than at the museum where we would usually be is that you are able to do this show and tell with us of the different books you have that inspired <laughs> these works. Um, so yeah, I love your story about kind of relying on this and wondering if there is like, you know, for any of us entering a different culture, you wonder, is there an instruction guide that I can look to that would tell me um, what is the appropriate way to interact or speak? And um, so yes, this, this work is so interesting because I think we also think of the Miss Manners book as ha being from a different time or kind of being irrelevant. And I love that you're pointing to this other relevance in terms of um, kind of cultural instruction for people who are new to the U.S. and kind of making fun of that as well um, and bringing your uh, ever-present humor to <laughs> bring your ever present humor to bear on these works. So I'm just showing another one called Ish O'Clock One. Um, <laughs> and um, I think that in this series, uh, including in this particular um, work, that you're drawing upon a number of references to create these overlaid drawings, um, especially from art history. And so I and other folks who are into modern American art might recognize this as, as a riff on Jasper Johns, I think. Um, but it looks like the numbers are funky. Um, maybe you could tell us a little bit about like what is the relationship, I guess, in this particular piece between these funky Jasper Johns appropriated numbers and then also the page underneath seems to say um, procedure and then it says ish o'clock, which I guess is the title. Yeah, anyway, thank you for calling it as 
ファンキー・ジャスパー・ジョーンズ。I really like that. <laughs> <laughs> And then the title for this work is Ish O'Clock. So I noticed that American people often say, well, let's meet at 5:30 ish or 10 ish. <laughs> so at first, I didn't understand that ish meaning. So for, for instance, let's meet at 5 ish means I thought it's somewhere between 4:45 to 5:15. But according to my husband, he said it's around. It's past five, five to five,、right. ten, or is it correct?、No? Um, I guess my understanding would, have, would be the same that it's after. Oh, after five.、Okay. So,、um, so, using ish was some kind of new concept to me. So, I started to think about how I can really visualize this kind of ish in between feelings. So, of course, I was looking at Jasper Jones. Right. Yeah. I love that so much. That's really funny that the numbers are a literalization of that idea of five ish or six ish.、Um, and that it's so, it's funny because in, an, in like a language class, in an English language class, I don't think you would learn about that colloquialism ne necessarily.、Um, so, in that sense, Ms. Manners actually has something to offer on this question of what is. Ish o'clock.、Um, I just want to show a couple more of these. This one is hilarious and I follows nicely on the last one called Ish because this is called Fish. And so you <laughs> definitely see that you have this Jasper Johnsy kind of interest in wordplay、um, in this series. And、um, maybe you could tell, I don't know if this, this the drawing overlaid here is a reference to a particular work of art, but it definitely is hilarious that there are these kind of Warriors with fish heads battling using a fork、um, on top of, you know, having this very intense battle scene on top of this Miss Manners page about fish. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I believe this work is about what is a proper way to eat fish or something. So Miss Manners suggests using certain fork, fish fork. But,、uh, But it's only for the kind of Western style dinners or meals. But for the、uh, Japanese style meals, I'm sure you do not want to use forks or knives, anything sharp, because sometimes in Japanese style meal, we use lacquerware. It's very, very fragile.、Mm. It's very fragile. So we use chopsticks. So,、um, if we change locations, the manners or rules change. s So, I, I thought it's a, it's a kind of never ending battle between people's perception what is good manner or what, what, is, what you should follow. So, this is、right. a never ending battle. I love that. I love the, the battle scene. I mean, I think what's so funny about this work in particular is that kind of gap between etiquette, which seems kind of so low stakes, and this very high stakes battle、um, happening on, in the drawing. And also,、um, yeah, it's, everything you're saying is,、um, is so funny and so interesting in terms of this question of perception、um, and those questions of kind of the gap bet between perception and reality. Are very much obviously a part of what you're interested in as an artist and in representation,、um, but also to this question of kind of the cross cultural、um, or how you know, how you know, how traffic and operate in,、um, in another culture. So here's another just great example called RSVP from the series of book page、um, drawings. And I will just、uh, ask you quickly, and I, then I want to show.、Um, One work from another series, and then we can open up for questions. But、um, many of these people have probably noticed that many of these works are、um, in graphite, and that the Umiyama labels were also graphite drawings.、Um, so you seem to have this affinity for working in graphite, and I'd love to hear、um, 
about why graphite is one of your kind of chosen and favorite media? Yes. Um, in Japan, I worked with clay about 10 years. And then after I came to the US, I continued my ceramics career for a while. So, um, and then I switched to graphite. I think that's because graphite is very immediate and direct, direct medium. It's just like if you got some ideas here and you can see something, you can really bring that ideas from here to here to here and then you can really connect from here, here, and then here to the paper very directly compared to like making ceramics. Mm. You want to mix with clay, you really need to plan ahead, right? And then if you want to do a bronze casting, you really need to plan ahead and you really need to coordinate everything. And sometimes you need to wait something to dry or you need to wait for somebody's help. But for graphite, it's very direct. And then I can work without stopping. I don't have to wait for the drying time or, yeah, I can really follow my urge. I like what you're saying. I mean, that that's helpful for, for those of us who aren't artists, because to me, I think, oh, ceramics, that sounds, you know, really direct too, because you're kind of working and feeling the clay. Um, but it makes sense what you're saying about you don't have to plan ahead and you don't have to. Mm -hmm. um, part of the directness is the immediacy that you can just put the, the graphite to the paper and kind of have your... Um, intellect flow out onto the page and that's one thing I've been thinking about looking at your work is how especially these works with the language and the overlay of the book page it does definitely have this feeling of like the cerebral and that we're kind of in your we're in a kind of intellectual or a, a psychic space of some kind um, and the Umayama work as well so it's interesting to hear that graphite does feel like it's this kind of extension of the brain and I think we can sort of see that um, in your work. Um, speaking of the brain and what's happening in the brain, uh, I wanted to just show one or two works here before we open it up to questions from your series called Unspoiled Territories. Um, and this is a work uh, for those of us who are dog lovers um, can relate to. It's called The Animal Dream Visualizer and uh, you can tell us about what we're seeing here in this kind of scientific or pseudoscientific drawing. <laughs> um, since you have a background in science, you know, you could tell me this is straight up science and I would believe you. But I guess who are, who are we seeing here in terms of the subject of this work? Is this your dog? Um, and what is the concept of this kind of unspoiled territory of the dog's dream? Yes. Um, you know, nowadays we have cell phones and then in internet connections and we can really get so many information, knowledge is really on our fingertip. But, um, and then I started to feel some kind of uh, information, suffocation. Mm. Just, yeah. yeah. I started to imagine what is not really untouched, what is really something we cannot know and then it was mm -hmm. animals dreams and um, I did just a little bit of research about if any scientists are doing researches about visualizing dreams and then yes unfortunately there are some uh, scientists in Japan they are doing real research about how they can visualize people's dreams while they are asleep. But um, basically I somehow feel animals' dreams are kind of last resort. We can really run our imagination freely. Yeah, I love that idea that um, especially with something that looks so scientific, um, like this, this drawing um, or this installation here that um, you said you created with 
the help of Dr. Lars Hansen, who I presume is some kind of engineer um, <laughs> at UTSA, um, that it looks so scientific, but that the concept of the work is about things that can kind of not be known, mm -hmm. um, and that space between what we can know and not know. And I definitely, I think all of us relate to your feeling of kind of information overload, um, and what are these places that are sacred or protected from um, from us ever knowing about them. And maybe our puppies' dreams are one of those spaces. So that's one of the things I love about this work. Um, I know we just have a few minutes left here. It looks like we have about seven minutes. So um, maybe we could open it up to questions um, moderated by our friendly chat overlord, if there's anything in the chat box that we missed. Um, yeah, so uh, Trip, hey Trip, was wondering that, you know, a lot of, Umayama's work focuses on his observations of the landscape, and he was wondering if Umayama, um does he ever write about the people of this strange land? Definitely, yes. He wrote about a lot of reports about the people he observed. Yes. But right now, it's being really kept kind of under the repository of UTPM, it's being uncovered. <laughs> um, and great, so if anyone has any questions that they want to ask aloud, please go for it right now. No one? Just in the meantime, I'm looking at the chats and it looks like um, <laughs> there's some amazing feedback uh, about the work being so cool and so imaginative and that you're making people see the kind of red and orange and white of our landscape um, and that there's a narrative of a female artist cr created from the, I guess, the kind of gender bending of you as a female artist inhabiting um, this male artist Umayama, which is very interesting. Um, and people love the time travel dimension. So it looks like there's a question, um, what are you working on now? Right now I am working on uh, Umeyama's uh, reports or Umeyama's ink drawings from Germany. So um, it seems like Umeyama went to Germany somehow and then he created a lot of works over there. So uh, right now, I and Umeyama are creating reports about Berlin. Very interesting. And we hope that they won't be buried by the UTTM and that they will eventually see the light of day. Um, and then it looks like there's another question. Um, are there any influences from Japanese cinema, uh, Kurosawa? Someone else. Oh, yes. I, I love that movie. And then um, um, in that movie, the, um, yeah, Cross of Us Dreams. I don't know that film. For those of us who don't know, um, how does it cross over with your work? Or I'm seeing the light bulb in your head right now. So what is it about? <laughs> I, I do remember some, some scenes from Kurosawa's movies and then one of the things I remember is a guy wearing kind of fox mask in black and white. Hmm. Um, and then I think like a, um, that movie itself is just like kind of weird, kind of dreaming. Mm. while we are, we are sleeping. And then um, I think maybe my idea of Umeyama finding Mokenshu was from my dream or something. So, mm. Mm. so um, our next question is that, um, as you've had to move classes online, uh, um, Melissa's wondering how this quarantine and the global situation is influencing um, your art or your way of teaching. Well, 
So I am spending more time on preparing teaching materials. So as you can imagine, teaching actual studio classes, like teaching drawing online is a challenge. It's just like creating Bob Ross, um, <laughs> <laughs> Bob Ross things by myself. So it was a kind of challenge. <laughs> but um, some of my students are kind of responding really well. And then one, one good thing about online learning is we, I can communicate with students like kind of talking to them really personally compared to talking to them in the classroom. So sometimes the email exchange is getting a little bit more personal and detailed. And then sometimes my students express their feelings through their artworks and then I can really relate their personal experiences in their artworks. I think that is a kind of beauty of the quarantine era. However, um, I really hope that we can go back to studio in the fall semester. Um, and I think last question, um, Lucia, um, another curator at SAMA is wondering, um, Thank you for sharing for your work, but with regard to Imiyama's reports, there's a lot of text in his work. Is there any interest in transcribing these texts into an accompanying book or pamphlet or other kind of written reports? Yeah, um, once I thought about that, but um, it's kind of weird, but I wrote all the texts, but now, I don't want to reread what I wrote <laughs> because it's written in such a kind of um, very um, about 200 it's written in very certain way the way the people in 200 years ago utilized so the writing system or some of the uh, Chinese characters are very different so even for me, it's a little bit hard to really decode Umeyama's text. So maybe I will need to hire somebody to really transcribe <laughs> <laughs> everything. I'm, I'm just waiting to see the ad on Indeed.com or Craigslist for someone to work at the UTTM as like a translator. <laughs> I think that's a wonderful idea. <laughs> I'll have to apply for the job. <laughs> I have no skills for it. But um, well, that was um, that's so it's so fun to talk to you, Hiromi. Your work is amazing. Um, oh, it looks like we have. Do we have time for one last? Question? Yeah, one last question. Yeah, for sure. Um, it looks like someone's asking, "Did you take any notes um, when you arrive uh, to the U.S. And do you still see differences after living in the U.S. Um, for many years?" Yes, I find differences really every day. So for to creating this uh, PowerPoint, PowerPoint presentation, and in she asked me some of the questions, including please share the tombstones for the works or something, right? You asked me the tombstone information. So, yes, I did ask you for that. <laughs> yeah. So that tombstone information is such a very new to me. And then um, it's very, um, very interesting to know those terminologies. Yeah, it's actually now that you've um, kind of pointed it out, it is quite a, kind, a, a grave uh, <laughs> um, nomenclature for, I guess, in the museum, in museum speak, what we're taught, um, a tombstone is just the artist title, date, caption information that you see here in the PowerPoint. But um, yes, I don't know what the origin is of that really dark kind of um, idiom. So, <laughs> <laughs> so funny uh, that you point that out. But uh, Inshi, you researched about the kind of afterlife of artworks. So maybe to me, it's kind of echoing like a tombstone information and afterlives of the artworks or first of artworks. So 
Yeah, it's yeah. so interesting. Yeah, it does make me think like, are by using that word, are we kind of likening the artwork itself to a grave? Um, and then, you know, does the, is the artwork kind of the ghost that's haunting the tombstone? I mean, you could extend the metaphor, I think, pretty productively. And like you've said, that's one of my interests. Um, but I've just, I've loved learning about your work uh, in preparation for this talk. And it's just so, so fun to talk to you about it. Um, and I think I'm going to go uh, into this evening and the rest of this kind of stay at home period with Umayama's eyes. Um, looking around my neighborhood at all the strange things and thinking about strange nomenclature like tombstone um, in the museum world. So thank you so much, Hiromi, for joining us tonight. Um, it was a delight to uh, look at your work and a big thank you from all of us um, at SAMA and thank you everyone who attended. Thank yeah. you. All right, everyone have a great evening. Bye. 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 Thanks.